Thanks so much for the nice introduction. And um, it's nice to meet all of you, if I haven't. Uh, it's great to be here. And I'm so delighted that, that you all came out tonight. And uh, I know it's hard. You know, family is a lot, a lot going on. And some of you traveled quite far you know, to get here. So I really appreciate that. And this is a topic that's very close to my heart as well. It's, these are patients that I've worked very closely with for a long time. Um, very involved with my patients at Duke, who I still am corresponding with, and uh, now I'm out here. And you're right, all, all I do is go out in a circle. You, know, <laughs> you just, you feel, uh, you, you know, you're used to things you know, and I, I was faculty at Duke, uh, then came out faculty here, but I always had a sense I'd be back here someday, you know, and it, it's great to be back to California. Um, but I'm actually from New Jersey, an East Coaster. Uh, my basketball loyalty is still to Duke, so. Sorry if any local people. <laughs> uh, I like Stanford, no worry. But uh, football, I'm warming up to Stanford and everything here. So I like the Warriors, don't worry. But uh, in between all that, I was in the Air Force and I was active duty um, back in the fourth to Iraq and during this time. They actually paid for medical school years ago. And it, it was great to serve my country and, and uh, learned a lot over there, you know, that we really can't learn back home. So. Um, but it's great to be back now and um, especially uh, talk about this topic, which is, to be honest, this is not a talk I, I gave before, so you have to bear with me. <laughs> um, you know, you have a lot of canned talks, you know, you sitting around and talk about Chiari a lot for many different types of settings, but this is something that has interested me for a long time. And this is out of a feeling that there's more to Chiari than some of these symptoms would attest to, where families will tell me, adults and kids, uh, teachers, that beyond the typical Chiari symptoms, this, they're, they're different. And that um, after decompression, some of these symptoms do get better. And it's hard to explain. And so it really opened up my mind to think how broad Chiari can be. And we're very much doing this now for other diseases too, like concussion is the big one. I do a lot of work uh, with concussion and that definition is becoming broader and broader of how to encompass all these symptoms. And there's a lot of parallels with Chiari actually. There's a lot of networks that are linked to the cerebellum of the brain and the back of the brain that if you look at the top 10 list for symptoms, you'd find the classic symptoms. You know, we'll go through these, but you know, you're familiar with them either from your own health or your family members, uh, that's why you're here. I mean, you, you're used to this lingo, but, you know, a lot of families go on the web, many more here than anywhere else I've been, <laughs> Silicon Valley, here we are, and they, these, you know, there's about 100 symptoms you could relate to Chiari, right? So the big question is what's related and what's not? And it's a tough discussion we always have of whether to fix someone with a Chiari, do we decompress them? And, this has been a big interest of mine in terms of picking the right people to decompress and leaving alone the ones that, that don't need decompression. And that, that's a difficult judgment that we, our science is lagging behind. A lot of the research we've done is based on a radiologic definition, a picture, an MRI showing a finding where the tonsils are below the level of the skull, right? The tonsils are down here. So that's the diagnosis. But as you know, if we do this and not talk to the family, you know, we're missing 98% of what's going on. And the problem with Chiari is, and it's even more difficult in adults, there's a lot of comorbidities that come up. And in kids, we just haven't uncovered them yet. They may be predisposed to them, we just don't know. But in adults, the things that haunt us are things like depression, um, chronic pain, fatigue, um, and, uh, um, you know, folks that really have uh, many other comorbidities, Ehlers-Danlos, we talked about, you know, with the, what, how does that contribute to symptoms? And should we be more aggressive or less aggressive if you have this ligament issue? The difficulty is our surgery could set them up for, a, a, you know, a future that can be fraught with other problems. We don't want to open up new doors or problems for someone, and here we have this primary issue. With, so I know I'm rambling a bit, but this is the, the crux of what interests me, you know, to really we have to do better. Um, and 
this is probably the hardest science to do because of this definition issue. And that, again, we're back to the MRI, but it's very hard to catalog these symptoms. So, you know, talking about these common data elements are, are huge to, so we can talk the same language and say, okay, we have X, Y, and Z clearly, and you didn't have this. And the Park Reeves Consortium, if you're not familiar with that, that's a, uh, it's for children, but it's several centers around the country of kids with Chiari and a syrinx. And, uh, you know, it's a 50-page data entry form to go through of all their signs and symptoms, exam findings, that is now following with that patient. So that continuity of care of surveillance is, is huge, and that's been lacking. What we're still missing is how I started this was the natural history. The natural history is what if we don't do anything and just watch what, what will happen. And we sure don't, it's very hard to watch a patient get worse and worse. You know, that'll, that'll trigger us to be more proactive to do something. But uh, to find out why they're getting worse is really where I'm going. And to think broader in terms of, well, it is the cerebellum, but the cerebellum has a lot of connections around the brain. And we should probably think about some of these broader topics. And I thought it might be fun. Well, it's fun for me. I hope it's fun for you. Uh, but it, to just kind of highlight where the field is with this in terms of what, what the science says about Chiari. So I don't think many people know about this, to be honest, because this, in meetings we go to, it, people will still kind of put under the carpet these other symptoms. And they say, oh, that's not related. This might get better. These will definitely not get better. And, you know, I, I really had to step back from that and, and open my mind because we don't really know, actually, what might, might get better. So it, uh, I think the more we can catalog these symptoms and listen to our patients, the, the better we're going to do long term. And my mentors do that, and I, I hope we can teach that, you know, in our residence here and, and elsewhere, of, you know, listening to the patient. And it becomes harder and harder these days <laughs> because of how the demands we're, we're under, the electronic medical record, the, you know, all these difficulties that, that really interfere with that doctor-patient relationship, but it, it's critical for this disease. We have to listen to what's going on in these patients. Or, um, if we go right from films to surgery and kind of ignore the rest, it, it can be a problem long term. Um, and setting the expectations for what might get better, what, you know, will get better, we hope, but, you know, we need to go through all that so you can understand that. So this is, the, you know, I call it the Chiari in the mind, the, the way we think about it. Um, you know, this is the anatomic definition, right? This is this whole issue of the, the tonsils descending down. And, you know, people always want to know, what does this part of the brain do? And how we fix Chiari varies. Right? There's a lot of variability in how different surgeons will fix Chiari. I have a way that I do it. I'm very consistent with how I do that. Um, and we don't want to overdo it, underdo it. You know, we're really careful on how we, how we fix them because there's problems with either. Uh, and we don't want to have to reoperate. We don't want to over decompress and have this slump issue. You know, there's, there's a lot of things we're thinking about up front. And the variability of bone decompression versus opening the dura, that, that we'll try to sort out, but it's, it's tricky. Why is it tricky? There's a lot of bias. You know, I personally open the dura, you know, most often because I don't want to have to go back and I've redone a lot of the others, you know, with, with having opened the dura. So I feel, okay, I'm going to be biased toward that. So to enter this trial, we have to say, okay, we, we really don't know which is better. We should probably think about it a little more and, and study that. But is it, you know, we, since we're biased, it's, you know, do we really want to enter every single patient into that trial? These are the ethic things we, we think about. For the, it's difficult because we're so biased on how we treat based on you know, what we think is the right surgery, and it's a judgment call. But, you know, some folks actually remove the tonsils. Historically, the, you know, you can aggressively just take the tonsils out and chop the tonsils out. Um, you know, I don't do that, but some do, you know, and the goal is to restore that spinal fluid flow, right? We've got to get good CSF flow. Uh, again, that's the goal. And if you have to take a little bit of tonsil to do it, okay, you have to do that. But, you know, in general, we're, we're not as aggressive as you know, the old days to, to be removing very large areas of, of, of tonsils. 
Um, is it still done? Absolutely. You know, is it right or wrong? We don't know, actually. You know, so we need to learn about that. So, you know, these are these different, these are an example of some of these databases. There's, there's many, and I, I can't wait for this registry. It's very exciting. It's going to be the best there is because there's so much thought being put into that registry uh, that I'm aware of. So, you know, to, to really catalog those symptoms will be terrific. Um, but if you look at the different, different symptoms, I mean, it's complicated, right? So all these in some way have been, we thought, related to Chiari. Right? You know, if you look at these, okay, ear pain, hearing loss. Well, how does, how does Chiari cause hearing loss? You know, if you start thinking about mechanism and, you know, it's difficult, you know, how can that happen? Um, well, this makes a little more sense, vertigo and some balance issues, nystagmus. That's cerebellar. That's back of the brain. That's coordination. That, 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 that makes sense, right? So the vestibular system is very closely tied into the vestibular system, the, the, the cerebellum. Um, vision, okay, this is a very interesting topic, you know, blurry vision. You know, we, the so association of Chiari and increased CSF pressure called pseudotumor is, is real. And it was underestimated for, for over years. And the reason is we don't do a lot of spinal taps prior to decompression. You know, we're too worried about sucking those tonsils down with a spinal tap. So it's rarely done, but we're always thinking about that. I always look in the eyes, you know, of the, of the kids and the young adults because they're, you can sometimes see elevated pressures. And, you know, in my opinion, you know, I'm going to give you a lot of biases here, <laughs> uh, but, you know, I don't like to shunt those patients up front. But there are some that would say, oh, there's blurry vision, there's increased pressure in the eyes, let's do a shunt first. Why don't we shunt? Well, I do the decompression and that goes away. A lot of it resolves in terms of that pressure. So. You know, I, I don't like patients to have a shunt if we don't need it. You know, that is a lifelong um, uh, tether, you know, that really can be a problem. Um, so the vision is, is difficult, and it may not be directly related to the cerebellum. It may be more indirect from the impairment in CSF spinal fluid flow. Does that make sense? And yes. Please stop. I, you know, I know we have four hours for this talk, but, um, <laughs> but you know, stop me if you, anything it doesn't make sense because... Um, Swallowing problems, does this make sense from a Chiari? Very much so. The nerves right around the tonsils are what we call 9, 10, 11 cranial nerves, and they all go to the, to the voice areas, to the swallowing mechanisms, to the back of the throat, to the sensory areas and the larynx, and to the uh, palate. So that makes sense, you know, and it can be very trapped, you know, with those tonsils right in those gutters um, where the lower cranial nerves are. But, these are pretty serious symptoms. You know, if you're getting something like that, you know, it's pretty tight uh, or there's some instability. You know, we're very worried about a patient with this kind of swallowing issues. The same as if a patient had nystagmus where their eyes are beating back and forth. That we think is more brainstem related, which is, again, ups the ante a bit from the cerebellum. Um, GI symptoms, you know, nausea, vomiting, you know, hard to relate. Well, just under the cerebellum and the fourth ventricle, which, which I, you know, back to this area here, okay, are the vomiting centers of the brain. Okay. Area postrema, it's called. So it, you can theorize, okay, there's some pressure, or, you know, maybe there's some GI upset. Um, sleep is a huge one that we've, again, me included, have ignored over the years. And, and why? We don't know what, how do we test sleep in the clinic? We, you know, we can't send everyone for a sleep study. Well, the concussion world is changing this now. Now with all the, hand, you know, the Fitbits and all, and there's even more sophisticated ways we use here um, that are, we think, a little more sensitive to pick up sleep cycles and all, and uh, we can put them on patients now at home, and you, we can get tracing of how they're sleeping. It's not a full sleep study where you have to be admitted, and, but it, it's sure a lot nicer for you all to keep, keep you home. Um, and sleep can be disrupted, you know, with Chiari to the extreme where you can get sleep apnea, central apnea, obstructive apnea. Those are much more serious. But um, sleep issues are a, a big issue that we focus on here. Um, the sleep expert, I refer him concussions and Chiari's routinely now back and forth, because I, I think it's a critical area that some of the daytime symptoms could be because they're not sleeping. 
So, you know, this gets complicated because a post-concussive kid from a little head injury on the football field or soccer field has sometimes a lot of the same symptoms. And I'll come back to that, which is a very important issue. But they have a big disruption of their sleep cycle. And that can cause a lot of these same symptoms I see in Chiari. So there, there might be some, some parallels. And what does concussion do? It disrupts networks in the brain uh, beyond the cerebellum. But that's the, the, the understanding that we're thinking about here is that this is not just a cerebellar problem, potentially. Um, and, and the way most of us hopefully are wired, we're connected. You know, there's lots of pathways going in and out of the cerebellum. Um, and these are more complicated, you know, bladder issues, bowel problems, fainting, blackouts, you know, things like that happening. We're worried about a syrinx. There's maybe something down the spinal cord. Uh, blackouts, a person I get very worried about. You know, that's something that can be pretty scary. Um, yes? question about the blackouts. Is that when they just, when they're, it goes black? Or like they can't see? Or is it like literally they just can't remember? Mostly it's they, they're, Pass out. pass out. Yeah, they become limp and pass out. And that, that's a scary thing to see. And it, you know, it, it may not have anything to do with Chiari. Sometimes these kids have other, you know, breath holding spells. I mean, there's other things that are way more common than this. But we, we have to listen to that story because it, it sure could be Chiari related. It may be worth a sleep study. You know, it, it would lead to further investigation. But it's not like they're fine and just can't see. Um, that, that's more like the ocular migraines, things like that. And that would be atypical. It's, it's more serious than that. They might just, you know, drop and become limp. Yes? Now, what about um, just falling down random and losing control of their lower extremities? Which yeah, is quite it's, it's hard to know, you know, why would it just be legs? It, you know, we, we see this generalized kind of limp. The serum, but it... Is, you know what my answer is going to be, is it, it sure could be related. But we, in other words, it, I would never say it's not. And I think that's the message here, is that, you know, the, the more we see and the more we treat, you know, and talk to the families, and, you know, we, we just don't know. It's just so complicated. And um, we have to just, you know, hear the story. You know, every person could be very different. Um, but this is why it's so complicated. Look at all the different systems that we're talking about here. Um, Some of those have to do with the, how, how did you say, how do you say the cor, comorbid, comorbid. Comorbid. comorbidity, right, depression, you know, a lot Pots. of the POTS disease, tethered the Ehlers-Danlos, tethered cord, you know, it's, you know hydrocephalus, uh, the pseudotumor, you know, there's a lot of other conditions that Impossible can make the Chiari more symptomatic, um, you know, whiplash injuries, you know, there's, there's small traumas that can do it. To make someone that's more compensated become symptomatic. So um, this is tricky, but many of these uh, comorbidities do make it difficult because they that patient may be harder for them to recover through this because they we didn't focus on the other comorbidity and you know that, that has to be treated also. You know, like depression, for example, you, we can't ignore those those things. Um, now, if you look at the different neurocognitive complaints. Now, that wasn't on the list, but almost half are experiencing memory problems. Well, where is memory, you know, in the brain? <laughs> well, no one actually knows, but, and I'm not going to try to talk through that, but there are key areas in the brain that are important for memory, okay? Temporal lobe, areas in the frontal lobe, working memory. Memory is a very complicated discussion, but... It's a network issue again. You can imagine all the networking that happens in memory to consolidate a memory so you actually remember this talk. You know, I know you're going to be thinking about this talk for maybe a few nanoseconds after. <laughs> you know, but it, it's, you know, it's a memory's complex. And why is there so much memory-related issues? And, and the family will tell you after decompression, some of this memory stuff gets better. Some of the speech improves. I have a child upstairs. You know, 24 hours, the speech, the family just told me half hour ago, the speech is the clearest it has ever been. The kid's 14 years old. You know, what, what are we missing there? I mean, it's, it's an articulation issue of the speech. There's a motor control of speech. Um, you know, the clarity of speech, the memory issues. I mean, that 
how can it be better that quickly? It doesn't make any, any sense if it's totally unrelated. It, it doesn't add up. And it's sustained. You know, it's not like it's better today and, oh, it's back to where it was. They get better from some of these things. So we, we have to, again, pay attention to that. Um, but look at all the other, these are the comorbidities I'm talking about. This is where it becomes very tricky uh, because of all the mood disorders, the anxiety particularly, a lot of the scores on your neurocognitive testing. We learned this in the military with your post-traumatic stress patients that they can have quite a bit of, you know, cognitive dysfunction. So they, they can look much worse on paper because they have anxiety disorders or other problems, depression. And that, that's an issue, right? You have to control for that in these patients. If you don't test for it, you know, you don't know, and, and you're going to basically link all these to Chiari, and that leads to genetic studies, that leads to, you know, registries. And again, if we didn't start out with the same apple, you know, we're, we're going to have trouble. The further and further we get away from that disease up front, we're not going to be able to interpret any of these registries, right? So we've got to be very careful. We can't ignore any of these things. Uh, which can be very important. But the most common is memory problems. Aphasia, if you know what that is, but that's more related to language, difficulty finding words, things like that. Um, articulating, counting, you know, repetition of words, that's different types of aphasia. Problems with planning, decision making, you know, multitasking. Well, these are the first to be affected in a concussion patient. You know why? Well, it's using multiple networks to try to, to uh, do something. So why would we have cognitive deficits? You know, why does it exist? You know, well, we can think of the cerebellum. It's structural. You know, it's pushing on something, right? That's the most you know, logical, that it's somehow it's pushing on the brain stem or um, it's too trapped in there. But it doesn't quite explain everything. How does it get into the prefrontal cortex, which is way up front? Uh, where there's a lot of planning and executive function, we call it. Anxiety, depression, chronic pain, all these relate, you know, to patients with Chiari and hard to sort that out. Um, and surgery, is it the surgery we do that can cause further trouble? You know, is that related in any way? Well, we don't claim it is, you know, but could there be a link there? Maybe it's CSF flow, CSF pressure. You know, this is where it becomes really complicated. So there's at least papers now. You know, this is from Mark Luciano when he was in the Cleveland Clinic. Um, thinking about there are cognitive effects. You know, it's a small group of patients, but Chiari patients that had surgery, basically showing that they have cognitive dysfunction. To be honest, a difficult study to interpret, right? Don't have a lot of tests on them before the decompression. So this is a dirty sort of population where we really don't know what's going on with these, these patients, right? But it, it, it's tricky, and it's a small number, which is why the registry is so key, you know, to give us big numbers, you know, pooling data. It's huge. Um, this is the, the test that was the, the most off, you know, and you can all do this test. Have you ever seen this? It's called the Stroop effect. Have you ever done this sort of test where you have, a, you, know, uh, you know, just maybe a, as fast as you can do it, you have to look at these word sets and basically say, you know, the, uh, the name of the, of the color. And, you know, usually you'll get it wrong because, you know, you'll say, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, um, orange, green, red. And, you know, you're, you're trying to go through this and interpret what the colors are and what, what you're saying. And you don't, you know, it's hard to get that right. You have to really focus. You have to have your attention. And if you take all the depression out and the anxiety patients, they still did not do well with the QRI patients. But the other scores all flushed out. So you could explain them all based on anxiety and depression, except for this one. So all these matter, you know, it, and it matters how we test patients in terms of understanding and what's relevant. But these are, are well, you know, described tests that are being done and we need to do more of these. We need to really test these folks before and after, like we do for epilepsy, like we do for concussion. You know, we get serial neuropsychological exams on them. You know, we really follow them way closer than Chiari. 
The most common in QR is, you know, you do the surgery, you decompress, you're often seen by a surgeon. And how often are you followed long term? In the adult side, much less than the ped side. The pediatric side, you know, we, we do follow much more closely just by nature of peds because the primary, the pediatricians often don't want to own this. You know, the, the primary care really, you know, on the adult side, we'll, we'll get these patients back. And hard for them to know, you know, when do we re-refer? When do we do another MRI scan? How often do we have to do an MRI? What's going on cognitively with these, you know, we don't assess that very much. So we don't have a lot of data here to, to use. There's not a lot of science that goes along with this. But this is how we kind of think about it. Um, this is from a paper in PLUS One, 2014. And so it's, this is all current. You know, it's finally we're getting somewhere. You know, at least people are interested in this. But five years ago, this wasn't even a topic. I, mean, I would be at the meetings, and this would be, again, not, not even discussed. And, you know, you, you've been there. You know these, these conversations. And it's, it was very frustrating for the families, right, to feel like, they weren't being listened to. So they, the kid was not right, the young adult not right, they're not performing at, at work. They're, they're really very different than they used to be. And the worry is that it's a progressive disease of, of, of further decline over time. Like we worry about in the repetitive concussion, you know, if anyone's seen that movie. You know, it's scary to think about that degenerative kind of disease. We don't want to think about it like that. You know, we're more hopeful, you know, that Chiari we could you know, have a good quality of life. We want to preserve that any way we can. And when we don't have that, you know, how do we investigate that to get to the bottom of, of what, what's happening? Um, so there are specific areas of compression and then more nonspecific, you know, about fatigue and like we talked about, the chronic pain. And uh, sorry. Sorry. Um, but you have to differentiate these, you know, in terms of compression-related, nonspecific, you know, how do you sort all this out? But at least we're talking about this now. You know, we're, we're trying to think about, you know, what, what are the mechanisms? What, what can we do about it, right? What can we do to try to improve the quality of life? And, you know, these are cool pictures. You know, it, it, uh, I figure by now you're sleeping, so I want to wake you up again with some pictures. Um, this is the cerebellum, believe it or not, of the brain. And, this is other parts of the brain in terms of where cerebellums are connected to, and it's all over, you know? So is it theoretically possible that the cerebellum could somehow influence other parts of the brain? Absolutely. You know, anatomically, it makes a lot of sense. Certain areas for language, social cognition. You know, socially, these kids could be, be different in some way. Personality, repetitive behaviors, motor impairments, that's more the arms and leg issues, the speech. Um, versus uh, this more processing of just irritable, you know, they're, they're just different. The very young kid, you know, they're irritable. You know, do they have headaches? Do, you know, we, we have no idea. It's very difficult to know what they're feeling, especially if they're nonverbal. Um, and they may have always felt like that. So it, it's very tough to, you know, experience their world, you know. So we rely on the, the, the moms and Mom's always right. <laughs> um, uh, I learned that. So, you know, you, you just have to, you know, listen because, it, you know, some, if they know something's wrong with that, their child, we, we have, it's really on us to find out, you know, what, what's happening. Um, and I don't want to bore you with all these projections, but this is the cerebellum, and there's connections up and down going back and forth, you know, from the cerebellum to the deep brain called the thalamus, the brainstem called the pons, and then the motor areas, association, frontal lobe. So, you know, we have some great imaging we can do now that, that is state-of-the-art. Um, things like this where we can follow these tracks, you know, and these are fascinating studies that, you know, we're doing here as well. You know, really fancy, best imaging we could do before we do anything. If you don't get that image then, we can't interpret much of anything. We have to have a baseline for each patient, right? Every patient's their own control. We, this is very hard to, to pool this data, you know, at 100 kids or adults. Um, so I think this is a very exciting area, and, you know, this at least will allow us to 
see after decompression? Do some of these connections get stronger? You know, are there missing connections that we can pick up prior to decompression that are strengthened later? And again, the concussion field is, is helping us here because that same rewiring and differences of symmetry left to right, you know, we see after a concussion, um, we're now applying to Chiari. So that I think that's really great to, to, you know, why not use the best imaging we could do? Why not do fiber tracking? All these great tools of color coding these tracks. We we're talking about imaging of the brain and how we now use that. You know, it's becoming state of the art to do this. But it only is helpful if you keep doing it with that same patient, you know, over time, right? You have to, you have to, <laughs> you have to keep following it. And MRIs, as you know, are, you know, they cost money, you know, insurance doesn't cover it all, there's out-of-pocket expenses, so we can't just do this for fun. These have to be, you know, either research-based or they have to, to cover the costs or we have to have a clinical reason to scan someone. Um, but it's otherwise, unless you have a syrinx, we're not scanning that frequently. You know, we get a before and after, but we don't routinely scan, you know, all, you know, yearly or, you know, and that, that's where the gap is in the field. We don't have these images. And, we haven't applied this kind of um, tracking of all these different areas, but we can now potentially look at some of the tracks from the cerebellum to the frontal lobe and see how they change, you know, with decompression. I think that's a, a very exciting area that, that uh, we're doing and others, uh, as well as some of the flow dynamics. MRIs, if, in case you don't know it, are now, we think, more 4D. Th these are, you know, three-dimensional, they're with flow, with movement, gated to the heart cycle, way beyond the CINE CSF flow study, which was what we used back in, when I was a resident, you know, back in the, well, a while back. <laughs> so we, we've moved past that, you know, where we focus on much more sophisticated flow dynamics, and the physicists are now interested in this, which is great. You know, we have a meeting here with engineers and physicists at Stanford with the imaging to talk about Chiari. I mean, it's a dream for me. It's great because they're interested in this disease. And why? Because it's, there's so much pulsatility, so much movement going on. And how does that change with decompression? Will that help us predict, again, who to operate on or who is having trouble that we should go back surgically? You know, so these are what, that's what the holy grail we're after is how to help someone back in the end. And um, we'll get there. We, you know, I think this is the, the era where... The imaging is going to, I think, transform our ability, you know, to, to pr make predictions, which would be wonderful for Chiari. But um, you can get some in incredible images of these tracks and, and how they relate just to this part of, of the brain, you know, right here, which most would say, oh, it doesn't do a whole lot. But now you know, and you'd be smarter than most, to be honest, that there is quite a bit going on there that we've overlooked, you know, over the years. And, um, so there are some things we can pick up. We, we now see differences. You don't have to focus on all the details, but I think it's just exciting we're seeing differences because if we did this with folks that had decompressions and didn't see any difference from controls, it's not going to be a great signal, right? But there are differences. So I think that's exciting that we're picking something up. We can then follow. We can hopefully see that normalize after we do something to try to help them. And Unless you know the patient well, it's hard to know what this all means, right? You have to be following these patients, and you have to be doing some serial testing of some sort to know how they're doing cognitively, or this doesn't really mean a whole lot. This is just an image, you know, by itself. And that, for concussion, we've had the same trouble, how to apply imaging to return to sports, things like that. It, it's difficult uh, to do this. But I think, you know, in the future we can use some of these to decide who can really benefit from a decompression. Or, you know, who, this is what we need up front, way back to the very beginning, before we do anything. Um, you know, but we start thinking about other things. Can a Chiari affect mental functioning and development? You know, how does age and development play into this? You know, a huge thing, you know, and... There are folks here all over the campus that just focus on child development and how the brain imaging changes over time. So you can't just do an image. You have to relate that to a control who's the same age, you know, as the kids are myelinating their brain. Myelin is the kind of the superhighways that form to make your 
conduction very fast in the brain. And there's so many changes happening between a, a two-year-old and a four-year-old. Okay, can we predict some of these curies that might get better, you know, on their own? Again, the natural history, okay, where we image so many kids over and over just because they're so worried about their curie, but they have no symptoms. You know, we may not want to intervene at all in those kids if they're, they're doing well and they have a really good quality of life. Why touch them? You know, the picture doesn't bother me. You know, it's hard to look at with the family, but it, the right thing is maybe just to watch. Okay, we have to be willing to do that. On the adult side, there's a slippery slope. You may know where they're operating on way more than they should be. Chiari means, okay, you see a neurosurgeon, it would often lead to sometimes to decompression. We have to stop, you know, and think, you know, what, what's going on? And we relate it mostly to the tonsils going down and what size and how many millimeters. We haven't correlated that with much of anything, with how patients do or outcomes or you know, how we do our surgery, it, it isn't as relevant as we think, but the families are fixated on that. 14 millimeters versus 12 this year, is that meaningful? You know, we have no idea, you know, so I don't put a lot of weight into that, but it might be if we relate it to tracks, if we relate it to more sophisticated imaging, there may be something to it. You know, we're just at the tip of the iceberg right now, but um, from a scientist's point of view, we're, we're excited about it. From a physician's side, we're we still need more. We still don't know how that's going to help the patient. And that's what you're after, right? We, how are we going to help, you know, uh, where we are, 2016? Um, whoops, sorry. So I think I'll stop there um, so we can maybe just have a conversation uh, about this uh, and, and get your thoughts because I'd, I'd love to hear your personal impressions and your stories around the table about perspectives of, either some here, or those that you've known, or kids that have had decompression, and, you know, the cognitive side. So, I, you know, we talked about all the common symptoms, but focus on memory, focus on speech, focus on multitasking and this executive function of planning. Um, if you could just think about that for a minute, I'd love to hear your thoughts of how relevant you think this is, because, you know, we just, this is what I think, you know, it's my bias, and I think uh, there's a reason I focus on this topic now because it's something that's on my mind more and more um, that I think we can do better in how we catalog some of these symptoms. So the registry, I think, is going to be crucial not to ignore some of, this is my pitch, <laughs> not to ignore some of these that may not be directly related but somehow are related that we, we don't want to miss out on that chance to capture some of that data prospectively or we'll never be able to see it. Uh, you know, so we have to think pretty broad, but the problem with registry, the more you put into it, it's not as feasible to get anything done because it's so complicated. Um, Park Reeves is difficult because it's so comprehensive, but luckily we're not enrolling as many kids for that. Each center, you know, it's manageable. Um, but these are the things we wrestle with. You know, you'd love to record thousand things, but we can't. But I, we have to focus on some cognitive symptoms because there's there's a signal there that we, we're just starting to grasp. And I think the more we can understand that, we can try to think about how to help, help the patients, which is why we, why we do this, why I go to work every day. So, um, but thank you for your attention. Yeah. So